right, let's go ahead and get started. So, hi, everyone here for Intro to Joomla? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good answer. So, hi, I'm Abby Milberg. I'm a front end architect at Third and Grove, which is a full service digital agency primarily specializing in Drupal. Um, and we're here today to talk about some things you can do in Drupal 8 to make images a little more interesting and give a little more control. So, our goal here, in a couple bullet points, we want to give our content creators a little more control. We want to keep the site consistent, performant, and secure. So, I think we've all had that project where the client wants a lot of control over images and then that winds up taking the form of putting it in CK Editor and it's either 600 pi pixels or 6,000 pixels wide or it's dimensions that don't go with the site, it doesn't have margins, all of these things, right? So we don't want that. Um, we do want some consistency, but we still want to give the client or the content editor that power as well as the designers, which has also driven a lot of this in my experience. Um, so today we're just going to talk about a couple examples of ways that I've found over a number of projects to do that, and hopefully you'll be able to take home the code, see the config, and use some of that in your own projects. Um, this is going to be pretty light on slides. It's going to be very heavy on code, but I'm going to make the code and the config in a feature all available on GitHub after the talk, so you don't have to worry <laughs> about trying to copy down every preprocess function line for line while you're sitting here. Okay, just as a brief sort of to frame the issue, Drupal 8 has given us a lot of power with images that we never had in core before. You've got breakpoint in core, you've got responsive images in core, you've got media in core with the help of some contrib modules, but once you get that set up, it's really powerful. So these things give us a great foundation to build upon even from the get-go that we didn't have out of the box in Drupal 7. Again, the question here, should all images be treated the same? When, you're, you know, when your client, your author has a blog post and an image field to go with it, do they all really need the same crop? You know, d does that make sense for all content? Probably not. They don't, you know, so we're going to give them some ways to fix that. The first example I'm going to go over is on using a CSS class generated by a list field to control the spacing of your images. So I've used this primarily when I've been working with grids, and it works with small images generally. You know, things like logos, things like SVGs, things that you may not want to ever crop because you don't know their uh, you know, you don't want to cut off somebody's face, part of a logo, that sort of concern. So small images where it may be appropriate to use CSS. So I'll go over an example of this. So I've uploaded here, this is an example of an image grid without anything in place. We've got an image style applied that is making all of these images the same width. Um, I think somewhere my design lead, who's not here, just shuddered in horror. Because um, th those don't look even, even though according to the rules of, you know, the same width, they are. And you also wouldn't want to put a crop on them. You wouldn't want a scaling crop style where you saw half of a can or half of a football. That wouldn't make any sense. So the effect we're going for is something more like that. And this is very rudimentary example, um, but it's pretty, it's pretty easy to pull off with a few lines of code. So I'm going to show you what this looks like from the author's perspective, and then we can dig a little deeper into the config and the preprocess functions involved. So this is the node that holds the aerosol can image you saw before. I've created a, dro a drop-down field here 
where you can choose its width. Is it default? Is it wide? Is it narrow? And that's all that that is from the perspective of the content editor. If we go into structure here, you can see this is really just a plain image field and a list text field. And for, sorry? Oh. And for display of the teaser, we're rendering the image orientation as a key. Now, you could, you could render it however you wanted, but the technique that I'm using here is all we're doing is with this pre-process pre function on the node, we're, we're getting that, the value of that field with the image orientation, and we're adding it along with an orientation modifier to the, the classes. Uh, array, and then we're hiding the field itself. And in this instance, all I have, that doesn't even require a custom con, uh, oh, no, that actually doesn't even require anything custom in the template. All I've got going on here is some really basic CSS, max width 40, 75, 90. Um, in the, you know, obviously those could be modified to your exact purposes. And in this case, I also did apply an image style because when we're using CSS to make things smaller, we still don't want to be making that 600, you know, that 6,000 pixel, pixel image smaller. So I am applying an image style here, which is just a scale, a scale style down to 300 pixels, something along those lines, so that it's not taking a hit on performance. Um, so that has, that has helped us a lot, especially on the homepage of our own site. We had a big grid of client logos, and you know, when, it looks, when it looks like this, it, it's just not good. <laughs> so that one is probably the simplest example I'm going to show. The next one I want to show is letting the user choose the actual image style from a drop-down, and by this I mean you know, predefined Drupal image styles that you're used to. And we're using a similar technique. Well, I'll show you it in an, an example first. The screen is a little small, but I've got my image field here, and I've also done one as media. Just I'll, I'll demonstrate the code for both if you're using a generic image field or a media field. And I've given it two options, one that I'm calling landscape, one that I'm calling portrait. And when we get to the structure of that, you can see that the fields themselves are pretty much as you would expect. And when we manage the display, we're using default on this one, we've got the image itself, rendering as an image, and I'm applying a default style to it, just in case. We've also got the image style value as a key, and I've created, a, again, a media field here. It's important to note there are lots of ways to use media fields with their own uh, display modes, but in this instance, the simplest solution for me has been to render it as a thumbnail, which lets you apply an image style right here at the content type level. So if we go into the code here, let's take this one at a time. So just like we did in the earlier example, we're getting the value of the image style itself out of the key there. And we, we're using a preprocess function where for both that image field and that image media field, we're able to simply replace the image style. And this doesn't require any templates. This doesn't require anything more complicated. Um, so if we go back to the browser and I change this to landscape, Now it's landscape, both of them. That's
that's the slide for everything I just said. <laughs> okay, so the next one is where we start to get a little trickier here. So in Drupal's picture module with the responsive images, we have this great ability to apply different image styles at different breakpoints, and we can even use modules like focal point to set the exact spot that we want to make sure doesn't get cropped in each instance. But what if we want to do a completely different image at different breakpoints? So has everyone lost the battle of no, you shouldn't put the text on the image for your website hero? <laughs> Right, so that's one where the image style for the smaller one doesn't work. I don't like doing it, I've, I, yeah, it doesn't matter. <laughs> um, so this is a way to basically let the user fill in multiple fields for those different breakpoints, if they insist. <laughs> so I, I will say a thing about accessibility in this case. This is not semantically correct if your images are drastically different from each other in terms of content. You know, or if the same alt text can't be reasonably applied to both images, this isn't what you should use in that case. This is for cases where you've got your banner image and you know, they've made the text centered and bolder on mobile or things along that line. If it's totally different, that's not what the picture element is for, so please. Just keep accessibility in mind. Um, in this example, I'm using two drastically, I say that because I'm about to use two drastically different images just to demonstrate what this does. <laughs> so we're getting smaller, and now you've got a completely different image there from a different field. From the content editor's standpoint, all this looks like is they have a large image field they have a small image field. You could add more breakpoints to this if you wanted using the same principles. I've chosen to make the small image field optional, um, normally because I find that making fields required comes back to bite you if they don't absolutely need to be. <laughs> so this gets a little trickier in the pre-process, but we will walk through it. So in this, instance, yeah. So first of all, the, the large image field I made required. I made at least one of the images fields required, although again, you could modify this, you know, just to skip over all of it if neither of them was filled in. So I'm loading using the image style load function, the hero wide image style of the URI of that image field. Since the small image field is optional, I'm using an if else statement to check for it and then set it appropriately. So if it is set, we are loading that image, that image with the, um, or that image's URL with the narrow breakpoint, or sorry, the narrow image style. And if the small field is not filled in, we're applying the narrow image style to that larger image, just like it would be if you did breakpoint functionality out of the box. And now we're passing these URLs to the template. Um, it's, it's not my preference to do this sort of thing in the template, but I haven't found a reliable way to build these picture tags in a preprocess function. Um, if anyone you know, can improve on that, that'd be great. I'm also passing the alt text of the large image field. Um, as I said, we want to make sure we're using alt text. The picture element in HTML doesn't allow for different alt text of the different sizes. So right here, I've, in the content type, made alt text required for the large image, but hidden it altogether for the small one. So this one, we are going to go into the template and just build our picture tag. Oh, I left out one step, which is the breakpoint. So Drupal 8 also has breakpoints built in that you can use across modules, across themes. You know, um, you use them if you're doing responsive images in the quote unquote out of the box way. 
So we're going to use those same those same breakpoints and leverage them in this so that it, we can keep it consistent across our site. You you could hypothetically put this directly in the theme, but there's there's not much of a reason to. So these last few lines in this pre-process function are to get all of the breakpoints out of that um, hero image group that I've created here. Now this happens to be minimal because I only needed one for the demo and set it as a variable, set, get the media query, set it as a variable to pass to the template. And now what we have is a picture tag like you've probably seen before, only it's using the two fields. Cropping. <laughs> who can tell who it is? <laughs> yep. <laughs> All right. So, <laughs> yeah, so there's a lot going on with cropping in Drupal. And part of the reason we're doing all of, you know, providing all of these choices around image styles and everything are to alleviate some of those situations where you're forced to crop the image that's, you know, 10 people in a row and you have to crop it into a tall, narrow image style and that just messes with things. Um, but sometimes you do need a style. So I'm going to talk about several ways to handle things um, to get around some of the issues that come up with that. So has everyone used the focal point module? If, yeah, great. So if you haven't used the focal point module, I highly recommend it. I've been using it since Drupal 7. Um, what it lets you do, I will show really quickly. There seem, uh, caching hits you at the worst time, doesn't it? There we go. OK, so if you can see, maybe I'll try and zoom in on this a bit. Can everyone see the plus sign here on the middle of the image? So with a focal point image style, when you upload the image, it lets you drag this little, curse, this little crosshair around on the image itself. And what that tells it is that on any focal point image style, it should retain that part when it crops. So if I use a scale and crop image style, normally in Drupal by default, that'll just scale and crop towards the center, which doesn't help me if somebody's face is on the left. So in this sort of instance, I could tell it to crop on the left. So if I do that here now and save it, <laughs> and wait for caches to clear, you can see now that that picture has been cropped all the way over to the left where I put that. Um, so that's a great out of the box, or not, it's a, it's a fantastic contrib module. I've found it works incredibly well in a great many situations. I have, however, had some situations where we couldn't use the focal point module either because um, the client's company had very strict policies about contrib modules or because perhaps we were uploading a lot of images um, via a script and there was never going to be a person actually going through and picking those, those focal points. Um, and sometimes, if you're lucky in those cases, you know the part of the image that you probably want to be kept more often. Maybe you know that people's faces tend to be towards the top, or you know, in these situations, are, they're normally not ideal. But if you want to systematically mimic the, the focal point functionality without having it, you can try to do so. So there's, there, this is a problem I've been having for a long, a very long time. 
And there's a couple approaches. So when you're creating an image style in Drupal, if you just create a crop style, and I'm sure you've all done this, if you create a crop style, you can That's what I named them all. <laughs> right, yeah. You create a crop style, you can choose your anchor point. And it's great. But if you create a scale and crop style, you don't have that option. So what everyone thinks at first, myself included in many cases, um, learned the hard way, was, well, I'll just scale it to the width or height that I want and then I'll crop the other dimension, right? So what happens when your image is not the orientation that you assumed it would be? Does ever, I'll show you real quick if anyone hasn't, uh, hasn't seen it. So let's say what I really want my images to be is 300 wide by 400 tall. And I'm assuming they're all coming to me as portrait oriented <coughs> images, right? So I scale them down to 300 wide and I crop them to 400 tall, which will let me choose my nice top anchor point. And I get that really nice black box as a bonus feature. Yeah, um, it's a thing, it's a thing. We've been there many times. <laughs> so how do you get around that situation? You basically have, what you have is you need different behaviors based on the dimensions of the image that the user has uploaded, right? It depends whether it's wider than it is tall or vice versa, or possibly even a more specific ratio than that depending on your image size. So, what I've got here is a pre -pro some pre-process function, a pre-process function, that lets us detect what those dimensions are and then potentially, potentially modify the image style as appropriate. So in this case, I'm fetching the value of the image field. And its height and width are actually right there in the array. You don't need to do anything funky to calculate them or anything. It's just the height and width of the image that was, gener that was uploaded, not cropped or anything, the uploaded image. And then we're just calculating a ratio here. So in my example, I, I'm saying that I want, in this example, a square image, a square image at the end of the day. So the ratio that I'm testing for is one. But if I had other, um, a different image ratio that I wanted as the outcome, let's say I wanted a two to three ratio, what I would need to test for would be if it met that, that two to three ratio or if it went over. Does that make sense? Okay, so I think um, you can see here, I'm using the same technique I used above with swapping out image styles, only now I'm testing for that ratio. And the cool thing about this one is the user doesn't actually have to, and by user I mean content editor, they don't actually have to do anything to make this happen. This isn't like the other examples where they had to choose um, it, it just happens automatically through that pre-process. So let's look at this example. We've got a test image. I've got a square image style applied to it. And you can see when I uploaded that, that was a landscape image. Now, if I go back to my image styles, ASDF, So I had profile default and profile alt. P 
profile default is assuming, you know, I'm assuming that that is a landscape image and that I want to crop it in from the center and it'll be 400 by 400, crop and scale 400 by 400. That's normal, you know, we can do that. But in that pre-process function, we're saying if it's taller than it is wide, I want it to first scale the width to 400 and then crop up. So this one is just cropping in as you would expect. But if we switch it out for, no. <laughs> I already had one. So we're going to switch it out for this image that's vertical. And that is my brother. And I did put that there to embarrass him. Um, he's not in Drupal. He, you know. um, but so this is the sort of image where we would want it to crop upwards. And please ignore the focal point thing there because it's, uh, it's there because I'm using focal point elsewhere. <laughs> and we're not actually using it in this case. So I put it you know, down here and it wouldn't matter. And now you can see it automatically cropped towards the top of that image. So. All right. The next example I would like to talk about. My slide's still a thing. <laughs> Background images. All right. So we love. We have designers and clients and everyone who love to have background images and heroes and things like that. And I mean, it makes complete sense from a design perspective, right? Especially we can use background cover in CSS. You know, it's, you get into a whole nother set of issues if you're trying to use, uh, you know, an inline image that you want to cover an unknown amount of space. It's just can be messy depending, again, on aspect ratios. But Drupal doesn't give us a great way to handle background images out of the box. Um, I think many folks here have probably done the same that I have many times in just getting that background URL out of a preprocess function and sticking it in an inline style tag. And I admit that that is part of what I'm about to show you. <laughs> but the thing that always bugs me about that is that it's not performant on a smaller device, right? Because an inline background image like that will load no matter what size you're looking at. It doesn't matter if you've got display none on the div. It does, you know, it's, just, it's gonna load if it's in there. And that's no good if you've got a background image that's gonna look good on somebody's full size desktop. So in this instance, I'm again using multiple fields to set different background images, or is it? Sorry, this one's not multiple fields, although you could do that. This one, I'm applying multiple image styles to the same image at multiple sizes, of the, at multiple viewport widths. And we're going to use a little bit of JavaScript to swap them out progressively so that we don't load those giant images when we don't need to. So if you look carefully, if you look carefully here for a second, I've got this moose set as a background image on this div. And I'm going to make it smaller. And all of a sudden, the, the, the image style changed. It wasn't smooth. You can, see, you can see where it changed, right? It jumped. There it is. So that's what we're going to do here. And the markup, I will show really quickly before trying to dive into the pre-process. What we're going to use is a data attribute and an initial inline style. Is that, that's a little hard to read, but it's, it's, it's about as big as I could get it. But I've got an, an initial inline style right there that is the smallest size of the image. It's the size that you would need on your average smartphone. And then I've got a couple data attributes here of the image at larger sizes. And we're going to use some JavaScript. So let's. Let's go back to that. 
to our code. All right, so this is pretty, pretty much, you know, we're getting used to this, right? Getting the, the images with the image style out of the preprocess function. So we're getting out of an, a media file this time, a media field this time, just to show that you can get these values out of either. Um, we're getting two versions of it, same image field. We're going to get it with the two different image styles applied, and the the URL of that, the raw URL. At this point, I am going to start applying these things as as attributes. So I'm using in this case attributes on the node itself, just because that's all I was doing with this demo. But you could put these anywhere in the markup you want. You could put these on a different field within the same node. You could put these on a random div that you placed in your twig file. Um, it really doesn't matter. But at the core of it, I'm defaulting to the small URL, just inline CSS, just like I was complaining about a minute ago. And I'm also creating two, two background, or two data attributes background small, background large. Um, oh, and I am, yes, adding, adding a class. Adding a class to it has responsive background, just so that we can key off of that for our JavaScript later. So the JavaScript on this one, that's the trick here, right? Because I hate using JavaScript for basic um, visual things like this, right? But I wound up weighing my hatred of using JavaScript for something this minor versus my hatred of loading a 3,000 pixel wide background on someone's iPhone. The JavaScript one. So the cool thing is a lot of this is, um, Drupal gives us some great tools like the debounce function built in, so I was able to not worry about that when um, when somebody's resizing their browser like crazy, like you know, only front end developers do. <laughs> but you know, <laughs> let's be honest. <laughs> um, but yeah, so what I'm doing, I'm getting, you know, I'm finding the div with these attributes applied. I'm defaulting. I'm, I've got a, var a variable here called small viewport. I'm defaulting to assuming that it's the small value, which I've chosen in this case is 768. You could do this with as many different breakpoints or any breakpoint that you choose. Um, may the odds be in your favor. Um, and, and I'm defining what I want that inline CSS to be in both of those cases. So when we're on the small viewport with, I'm gonna, you know, this is the variable I'm gonna apply, the small background, ditto for the large one. And if, yeah. Oh, oh, that's what, it, okay, sorry. If you've got this, if you don't have the small report, we're gonna apply the large CSS. So that's happening on load. Since on load, I've got the inline style showing the small image by default. All this is doing is on page load, checking if, we don't have document width of less than 768. Again, this is a, this is a Boolean here. Um, then we're gonna swap out the style tag for the, or the style attribute for the large background. The trickier part is listening on resize. Um, please, please, please debounce this. Don't, don't make it worse than loading the 3000 pixel image. Um, I've got, again, I'm debouncing this every quarter second. I chose. Um, if you're, this is again checking if we're on the small or large size. And we also have the small viewport. Whether, yeah, if, if the state matches the existing state, we don't need to know. So we don't need to do anything if we resized, but before it was 400 pixels and now it's 430, it, you know, it doesn't matter. So we're returning out in that instance. Um, however, if they don't match, we're setting the appropriate style for the new state. And then we're calling it on resize. 
Everyone with me? It's, it's not, I have not discovered a completely clean scenario for these background image options, um, but this is one I've found that seems to be more performant than most. <laughs> If, yeah, I would be very interested if everyone, if anyone has found another approach to that. Okay. All right, SVGs. <coughs> Next topic. Nope, SVGs. <coughs> so I gave an earlier version of this talk at uh, last year's Drupal GovCon, and when I did that and when I wrote my application for this talk, there was really no good there was no non-beta contrib solution or core solution to using SVGs as images in Drupal. Um, and, and that's been a real struggle. I think a lot of people have dealt with, uh, you know, especially designers and clients and, you know, it's just not being able to have an SVG as an image in this day and age was, I think, a serious shortcoming for Drupal. And I had a lot of methods I'd worked out to work around that. And then in January, a really cool contrib module went uh, stable called SVG image. And I had to rewrite half my talk. <laughs> but no, in all seriousness, um, it's a fantastic module. I've worked with it on client sites. And it does exactly what you would want in at least 99 out of 100 cases for it to do, which is it just lets you make SVG an accepted extension of, you know, on your image field, your existing Drupal image field. Um, so I'm going to show you how that works real quickly, and then we're going to talk about a few other things to keep in mind about SVGs. So this is just, and you know, this is just your run-of-the-mill Drupal image field. I've got. You know, I've got my alt text. There it is. So that is the size that it uploaded. You saw that that planet was completely distorted. You know, that right there is the the view box that the um, the SVG came with out of the box. When you're um, setting up this content type, there are a few things, or this field in a content type there are a few things you can do about this. So as I mentioned, it just lets you add SVG as an acceptable extension right here. Um, when you manage display, you get your normal image style choices, which do, they just, the SVG will ignore them if you put an SVG in this field, um, but they will still apply to your other ones. I was worried when I first saw this that it was gonna spit some horrible error if I tried to put an image cell here and it, it functions beautifully. You can set image dimensions here for the SVG if you want um, to, to force them to be the same size. That's, you know, that depends on your use case whether that's gonna be a good idea for you. In, in my cases, I haven't wanted always to force them to be the same, same size, but I've also had pretty good control over what got uploaded. So it depends, and this is one of those scenarios where I found that choosing image orientation CSS trick to be really useful as well. Um, you can also choose whether you want to render, I'll make this bigger, whether you want to render the S SVG as an image or as an SVG tag. So that's, that can be really cool or really dangerous. So I'm gonna turn this off now. I'm gonna let it render as an SVG tag and show you. Okay, so there's, there's the phone. Here it is as an SVG, an SVG tag, I should say. So nothing about this has changed from the file I uploaded. 
If I pulled that file, that SVG file from my computer open in Sublime Text, it would be the exact same thing. You can see the automated Adobe Illustrator generated thing. Um, what you see is what you get here. So in this instance, it's pretty good. I know, I happen to know that I can trust that image. The thing to keep in mind about SVGs, and I'm, to be clear, I'm not saying don't do this, but the danger with rendering them inline as opposed to as images is that an SVG file is really a document in its own right, right? It's not really an image format. You can put JavaScript in an SVG file just stop and think about security for a minute. Um, so again, that may be one of those situations where it depends on those use cases. But a lot of it in those scenarios is gonna come down to how much do you trust all of your content editors? And by trust, I don't just mean their intentions. Hopefully nobody malicious, hopefully has access to your site but they're tech savvy. I can go Google for SVGs on Google image search and come up with goodness knows what, and I might really not want it on my site. So just be very careful if you're gonna do that. Make sure there's a good reason and that you have um, some sort of review process in place and that you and your client are aware of the risks and choosing to accept them with knowledge, you know? Um, that said, there's some really cool things you can do with CSS with these inline SVGs, it's great. On the other hand, you, given that these are nodes, you know, these are fields in nodes, normally you're not gonna be styling them on a one-off basis. So I'm, I'm sure there are use cases, but I think most of the time you probably don't need an inline SVG but using them as images is fantastic. And by all means, don't take me as the gospel on SVG security. Um, just keep in mind, you know, look it up if you're gonna do it. And that is, by the way, over here in that same image grid. Well, it doesn't look very fancy because it's such a small image to begin with, but um, this is a mixture of SVGs and bitmaps, so, or not bitmap, you know what I mean. Pings and JPEGs and GIFs. So, I believe that that is it for my slides. Um, all, th the last parting thought here is modify anything you saw above. Mix, match, you know, um, change the number of breakpoints, change the number of styles, combine them, to, you know, make it your own. I hope that you can take away from this talk not just what I showed specifically, but also some general approaches. And, and I'll get questions in one second, but if, if you have to leave, I understand. And you can find the, the, all of the code, all the config and code that I showed on GitHub at abby805 slash d8 images. So um, thank you all so much. Um, questions, please. Yes, hi. Um, hi. I'm wondering if you've had any experience with the image effects module in Drupal 8. Um, its predecessor, image cache actions, allows you to, um, within the um, image styles area, to um, choose aspect ratios to choose which style to apply. So I was wondering. I haven't had a chance to work with that one in D8, no. Okay. Um, I would be very interested to talk about it, though. Yeah. Sorry, thanks. Image effects in Drupal 8 and its image cache actions in Drupal 7. Yeah, thank you. Um, I just wanted to point out that we at Eastern Standard have a solution for that responsive background thing that you were talking about. Um, oh. We have a library, it's called responsive backgrounds, and it essentially uses the picture module. So you just have one image and you'll apply the crops we're using, uh, what's that? Not crop API, but image widget crop. Um, so you'll just set all of your uh, images based on like, all right, on mobile, I want it to look like this, you know, tablet on this, desktop on this, and then all you do in your template is spit out the picture tag. 
Um, and then in JavaScript, you just say, all right, in this CSS class, look for the picture module. And it does essentially what you're doing. Oh, cool. um, and it's more flexible in that you don't have to go into JavaScript and actually manually just like add those breakpoints in. It's oh. more flexible that way. You could just define your breakpoints like straight off the bat if you want us to send you that. Oh, that'd be great. Thank yeah. you. Is it on, <laughs> D is it on uh, Drupal.org? No, no, no. It's just a li it's just a JavaScript library, but okay. it just leverages that. We've been using it since seven, so. That sounds great. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, totally. Any other? What I can do is just share it with her, and then maybe she can share it with other people. But it's something that we created like in-house for that. Um, it's just a JavaScript library that just, again, looks at that picture tag. And it already has, like, if you have used a picture tag, it knows, like, the picture tag will say, OK, this image will be used in this media uh, query that you defined or whatever. So it'll just like look at that and then responsibly like, change those things out. Um, so it's not like as hard-coded as like, the example above, where it's like you can actually manage it. Um, in your config or in Drupal. So cool. uh, I'm not sure how we can spread that out, but we'll figure it out. Great, thank you. Yeah. Um, so you were talking about accessibility earlier, and I went to a training yesterday, and they were talking about the um, frustrations of background images and CSS and the lack mm -hmm. of alt tags. Yeah. And is there any way, have you found any workarounds for that? Um, so. Oh, I went to a fantastic talk earlier from a gentleman who could probably speak to this much better than I, but I found a couple things. I mean, A, if it's content in the sense that you can't miss it and still have the meaningful result on the page, it, it, or experience of the page, it's probably sh it probably shouldn't be a background image. I, I, if anyone want, you know, I'd be interested to hear other takes on that, but I think of some, if it has, text on it that should be alt captioned, if it's just important content, I think it probably belongs in an image tag. If it's the flowery meadow in the background of your hero image, like I, I don't know what the thoughts are on whether that needs to be um, you know, made it as accessible, I guess. I do know there are some ARIA tags also that um, can be used to label things, but I am honestly not sure if that's best practice. So, I, yeah. Hi. Hi. Uh, thank you for your nice talk about this uh, interesting topic about creating these file formatters, right? Which mm -hmm. have state now. And file formatters are supposed to not have any state, which is something the core ships with. And there are limitations why you would want to kind of style images one way or the other. Do you have any ideas about if this idea is generic enough for files also? So for example, I have a CSV file. And I can, based on the size, I can choose to either display it inline in the browser or make it available only for downloads. It's I think they can do that already. Like when you, when you render a file in a view mode, uh, just a file field, you can right. choose between displaying um, displaying in line or displaying a link. Um, but that's probably limited by format. Right, and but I but, can't speak as much to non-image. I see. So I'm thinking that yes, you can set the formatter, but it's global. I want to s let the editor set it on a file per file basis, whether they want to display it one way or the other. CSV is just an example, but can be extended to other kind of things. Yeah, I mean, I think anything that Drupal allows you to choose between various modes of display, you could alter that mode of display in a preprocess function. Um, but there are certain file types that just won't render in a browser. Sure. So, yeah. All right, thank you. Yeah, thank you. All right, well, unless there's anything else, thank you all so much for listening and uh, appreciate it. Thank you.